Adventurers down through history have made spectacular claims about the discovery of all kinds of biblical sites or holy relics. The Holy Grail, the fabled King Solomon's Mines, and more recently, Noah's Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, and many more have been featured in fabulous tales of adventure and discovery. Adolf Hitler was allegedly in possession of what he believed was the Holy Lance, the spear used by the centurion to pierce Christ's side. This was only one of many relics the Fuhrer obtained, or sought, to satisfy his obsession with the occult. Interestingly, several such genuine spears are owned by various collectors around the world today. Not surprisingly, the cup of Christ used at his Last Supper, dubbed the Holy Grail, is also simultaneously in the possession of several people at different locations. It even has a movie based on it, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Then there are pieces of wood from the actual cross of Christ. In the 4th century, Helena, the Roman Emperor Constantine's mother, made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. There, with a rapidity and assurance that can only strike wonder in the modern archaeologist, legend has it that she unearthed the true cross, the lance, the crown of thorns, and identified, under a temple of Aphrodite, the tomb of Christ. This cross became an object of pilgrimage, with pieces cut off as a token for those who made a generous offering. Theologian John Calvin wrote that, by his day, there were so many parts of the true cross around that, whereas the original cross could be carried by one man, it would take 300 men to support the weight of the existing fragments of it. Similar amazing discoveries are still announced today. Sometimes they're based on ignorance or rejection of scripture. For example, it was recently claimed in a Time Life documentary that the site of the Garden of Eden had been found. But we'll get to that in a moment. Has the Ark of the Covenant been found? Originally published March 1999. Let's go through a list of these. Could the Garden of Eden ever be found? The Bible says regarding the location of Eden, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Genesis 2.10 Two of these rivers are called Hiddekel, or Tigris, and Parath, also known as the Euphrates. This is why many Christians believe that the original garden was located somewhere in the Mesopotamian region around present-day Iraq, where the modern Tigris and Euphrates rivers flow. However, the Bible records a devastating worldwide flood, many centuries after Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. Sedimentary layers, sometimes miles thick, bear mute testimony to this massive watery upheaval which tore apart and buried forever the pre-flood world. After the flood, the survivors moved to the plain of Shinar, Sumeria or Babylonia, which is where we find rivers today called Tigris and Euphrates. These are therefore clearly not the same rivers. They run on top of flood-deposited layers of rock containing billions of dead things. They were probably named after the original pre-flood rivers, just as settlers from the British Isles to North America and Australasia applied familiar names to many places in their new world. Note also that the Bible speaks of one river breaking into four, only two of which were called Tigris and Euphrates. This is not what is found in the Middle East today. So the garden's actual location on the globe can never be established. Maybe it's where we now find the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Now, in the case of other recent discoveries, however, the would-be Indiana Joneses are very familiar with the Bible. Perhaps the most well-known are the claims of one Ron Wyatt from Tennessee, heavily promoted also by a Jonathan Gray from South Australia. The Wyatt and Gray claims are truly astonishing. Unfortunately, reputable Bible-believing archaeologists and other experts willing and capable of giving an objective assessment are never able to check out the claimed artifacts. There is generally a plausible-sounding story as to why that is impossible or why the time is not right. The alleged finding of the Ark of the Covenant is associated with claims of supernatural intervention, photographs mysteriously getting fogged or vanishing and men-in-black-style government cover-ups. Are the claims true? If they are, 
Such a staggeringly impressive list would mean that Ron Wyatt had been almost as miraculously assisted by God as the patriarch Moses. If, however, a careful examination of just one or two of these claims reveals them to be false, fanciful, or fraudulent, the divine leading option evaporates, and it is clear that Christians are being seriously misled. Now, let's talk about the non-Ark site. Back in 1992, Wyatt's Noah's Ark claim was subject to a thorough investigative expose in our very own Creation Magazine. A 13-page report told of how this ministry had checked the claims, even ringing the lab staff that had done the analysis, for instance. Sadly, though we would have been delighted if this were really the Ark, we found almost all the specific claims to be untrue and or misleading. The results of detailed analysis of this site, including mapping, magnetometer surveys, drill core sampling, and more, enable any geologist to be able to diagnose with certainty the exact nature of this geological object. The discoverers have since produced a rebuttal, convincing only those who have misunderstood or not carefully read our article. The quote has support the well-known creationist scientist Dr. John Baumgartner, but in fact he long ago decided that this find was a geological formation. They also appeal to the late marine engineer David Faisalt. Faisalt, who had repeatedly rejected biblical authority, did originally think it was a boat, but towards his life's end, co-authored an article in a geology journal supporting its true nature. When questioned about Baumgartner's retraction, Wyatt has claimed that it was made for fear of losing his job. Yet Baumgartner has been known as a full-on creationist in his job and community for years, and had no difficulty agreeing to our publishing an interview with him in 1997. At that time, he told us that Wyatt's claims about himself were as bogus as Wyatt's claims about the Ark site. So, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Creation Ministries International did not attempt to involve itself in checking any of the other claims, but someone who had been with Wyatt to his Sodom and Gomorrah site sent us samples he had from there of the alleged ash from a couple of the buildings, and a sulfur ball. The photos show the structures of Sodom and Gomorrah, together with the labels put on them by Wyatt. Simple visual inspection of such photos, and watching videos put out by these amazing discoverers, strongly suggests that these building ruins are soft sedimentary structures with some lamination, carved into an array of shapes by rain and wind. To put it mildly, the claim that such structures would form from incinerated buildings, then survive in the open for thousands of years, defies understanding of basic scientific principles, not to mention common sense. Nevertheless, we sent the samples for chemical analysis to a reputable Australian laboratory. Their report was interpreted by a PhD geochemist. The existence of the sulfur ball was not surprising. The entire area is rich in natural sulfur. The results from what looked like ash were not consistent with what would be expected from incinerated ancient buildings, or rock ash of any sort. Instead, they clearly indicated an evaporite deposit of gypsum-type minerals. This crumbly, easily eroded material fully explains the visual impressions, and is consistent with the known features of this area. The chemistry also shows an abundance of carbonates, which would be broken down by heat. So, the remnants of Sodom and Gomorrah? The discoverers featured in our article have persuaded a number of people unfamiliar with basic geology that from their pictures, you can see in the city of Gomorrah a ziggurat and a sphinx. However, the truth is less spectacular. In this Dead Sea area, there are many soft evaporite deposits like this, which can easily be shaped by the action of wind and rain. Not only has on-site geological analysis shown that this is the case, lab testing of alleged ash samples definitely confirm that these are not burnt buildings. And then there's Pharaoh's chariots. Some unsolicited evidence also came our way concerning the alleged chariot wheels of the Exodus, which have never been made available to any archaeologists, Bible-believing or otherwise. There is a Jonathan Gray video purporting to show these on the bottom of the Red Sea. In one part of the video, Gray claims that a British admiralty chart he is holding shows a sand bridge with great depths either side. The Hydrographic Office of the UK Ministry of Defence is, by international agreement, the authority for charting the Red Sea. A Mrs. M.H. sent them the video, and they wrote back to her that, 
Gray's chart could be positively identified on blowups as United States chart number 62020. And contrary to Mr. Gray's statement, the sand bridge is not now, and never has been, a recognizable feature on British Admiralty charts. Nor is it recognizable on the US chart held by Mr. Gray. And Gray's comments about the great depths also mislead. The naturally lit video footage of the seafloor could not possibly have been filmed anywhere near the spot claimed by Gray, as insufficient light would penetrate at that depth. Subsequently, Gray published a second letter from the same office, claiming it vindicated his claims of a sand bridge. However, when we checked with them, they wrote that their comments had been seriously edited, with selected parts shown under their letterhead. The full letter which they sent us, quote, does not confirm the existence of a sand bridge. <sighs> In short, whenever we have the opportunity to objectively assess any of these claims, the same pattern emerges as from our ARC investigation. In closing, there is little doubt that the genuine discovery of certain objects would be both exciting and a powerful witness to the truth of the biblical record. However, we need to be careful not to become like some medieval pilgrims, keen to have relics to supplement or supplant the worship of the living God. Christ actually taught that if people did not listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither would something as spectacular as someone rising from the dead convince them. No doubt such fanciful claims as discussed here will always be with us, made by those seeking either profit, fame, the fulfillment of some deep psychological needs, or any combination of these. The discoverers will often appear completely sincere, saying all the right Christian things. Perhaps at some point they even persuaded themselves. Remember, the Bible does not say that we should believe all things, but rather that we should prove all things. Read 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Neither does it encourage a gullible approach toward those claiming the name of Christ. Rather, it warns about wolves among the flock, and also teaches that the heart of man is deceitful and depraved. Jeremiah 17.9. As in other areas, extraordinary claims carry an extraordinary burden of proof. There is already a huge amount of archaeological and other evidence consistent with the truth of the Bible. Bible-believing experts exist in many fields, such as the archaeologist author of our article on the walls of Jericho. They are always glad to assess and publicize actual evidence of genuine finds supporting the historicity of the Bible. Oh, and uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Let's get back to it. Could it even be found? The Ron Wyatt and the Jonathan Gray track record of false claims on other objects, which we've already gone through, makes it easy to dismiss these current claimants to finding the Ark of the Covenant, along with all their reasons as to why no one is conveniently allowed to access any hard evidence. The Ark of the Covenant was probably lost or destroyed when the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem in 587 BC and destroyed along with the temple. If Jews had hidden it, the Ark would surely have been used in the Second Temple, which Josephus says it wasn't. An additional reason for skepticism, which would apply to any future such claims by others, relates to God's dealings in fulfilling the Old Covenant system via the New Covenant in Christ. God forcefully demonstrated this with the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple in AD 70, predicted by Christ four decades earlier. Read Matthew 24. There were to be no more animal sacrifices once his designated Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, had been slain once for all. Jeremiah 3.16 strongly suggests that there is to be no reappearance of the Ark of the Covenant either. And it shall come to pass, when ye be multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, saith the Lord, there shall say no more the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall it be done any more. Oh, and before we go, what about the other ark, Noah's Ark? Well, many people have seen photos similar to what looks like an ark, depicting what some continue to claim is the remains of Noah's Ark. However, this is an unusual, though natural, geological formation. A thorough investigation of evidence from that site along with the eyewitness testimony of Bible-believing scientists who have been there, confirms this conclusion. Has the Ark, or some of it, survived the ravages of time in some form? 
tantalizing clues and alleged eyewitness accounts from locations on Greater Mount Ararat are available. However, to date, all efforts to find any definite hard evidence to confirm them have failed. Creation Magazine has and will continue to report reliably on this issue, so you will know when and if God should permit such an important find. You know, I do love listening to podcasts, and that's one of the reasons that I produce this one. I have subscriptions to shows with all sorts of topics, but I never let good listens get in the way of good reads, where some of the best resources are to be had. I make the point to read a lot, and that's why I'm glad that I can honestly tell you that Creation Ministries International publishes one of my favorite knowledge sources, Creation Magazine. The article from today's podcast was originally from Creation Magazine. In four issues a year, our magazine addresses the most interesting and perplexing creation subjects for every reader in the family. Our team of scientists and experts deliver accurate and current information that gives answer to evolutionary arguments and defends your faith. It makes a great evangelism tool for young people too, so you always have something to discuss among your peers in school. The printed magazine's shipping is free, and you say, Joseph, I don't want a printed magazine. Well, this is a great time to give your printed copy to a friend, because the digital edition can be shared on up to five of your household devices, and you'll always have access to back issues. Seriously, Creation Magazine is one of the singularly most biblical and scientific publications today, so why not take advantage of it now? Sign up today at creation.com forward slash magazines. And if you already have a subscription to Creation Magazine and like it, think about sharing it with a friend. I am Joseph Darnell. For all of us at creation.com, thanks for listening.